أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر إلى ربك كيف مد الظل ولو شاء لجعله ساكنا ثم جعلنا الشمس عليه دليلا ثم قبضناه إلينا قبضا يسيرا وهو الذي جعل لكم الليل لباسا والنوم سباتا وجعل النهار نشورا وهو الذي أرسل الرياح بشرا بين يدي رحمته وأنزلنا من السماء ماء طهورا لنحي به بلدة ميتا ونسقيه مما خلقنا أنعاما وأناسيا كثيرا ولقد صرفناه بينهم ليذكروا فأبى أكثر الناس إلا كفورا الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Inshallah, we're starting with ayah number 45 today. A translator writes for ayah number 45, Do you not see how your Lord lengthens the shade? If He had willed, He could have made it stand still. We made the sun its indicator. So, in this ayah, of course, just to first comment on the language once again in the beginning of the ayah, because in the previous session we talked about ara'ayta. Have you seen? Have you considered? This is the opposite that I was talking to you about, uh, or the other way to make a similar type statement. Alam tara. That have you not seen? Have you not considered? Have you not thought? And as I mentioned yesterday, that it usually talks about something that's more obvious and something that's you know, apparent and very well known and documented, and then tries to, you know, uh, bring about some realization from that reality. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here says, Alam tara ila rabbika, that have you not looked to your Lord, your master, have you not thought about how your Lord and your master does the following? So there's something very interesting here that um, some of the Mufassirun mentioned. They talk about the idea that. This statement of Alam Tara, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it a few different places within the Quran. And some places where this statement is made, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points to um, a particular event, an action, an occurrence. The primary object of what to consider, what to look at, what to think about is an event or an occurrence. And then some places Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking points to something very specifically. And here, for instance, so when you see Alam Tara, Kaifa Fa'ala Rabbuka. Have you not thought about, have you not looked to, have you not considered how your Lord and your master, what he did, how he dealt with, you know, the people of the elephants? But here Allah says, Alam Tara ila Rabbika. Have you not looked to and thought about your Lord, your master Allah? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about what exactly He does, but He first says that the direct object of what have you not thought about and considered is Allah Himself, Rabbika, your Lord and your Master. And this is once again because in a lot of those other um, passages, in a lot of those other places, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pointing to a particular event or an occurrence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about a particular reflection or a particular lesson is being imparted there. Alright? And so over there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Fil is trying to impress upon the people of Makkah, the people of Quraysh, look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has protected you throughout the generations. And over here, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing and is talking about the concept of tawheed, belief, oneness of God. So while he will point to something, you know, magnificent and miraculous that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does for humanity and the favor of Allah's uh, upon humanity, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost directly calls their attention to think about their Lord and their Master Allah because He's impressing upon them the oneness of God. And that's the primary subject here. Which leads me to talk about that if you, once again, I'm going to recall and I'm going to you know, take us back to um, the discussion that we had at the very beginning of the surah, the study of the surah, where we talked about the different passages within this particular surah. And we had talked about the five main passages that are present within the surah. And the fourth passage of the surah is the one that we are starting today, which begins at ayah number 45 and concludes with ayah number 62. 45 to 62. This is the fourth passage of the surah. And the primary focus of this particular passage is establishing the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and presenting all the blessings of Allah and so many of the miraculous signs of God that surround us that lead us to the one inevitable conclusion and that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the master, Allah is the creator and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that is worthy of our worship. And He alone is worthy of our worship. So now, moving on to the, what the ayah is actually presenting, Allah says, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ كَيْفَ مَدَّ الظِّلَّةِ How He has extended the shade. How He has extended the shade. Okay? Um, there's a lot of discussion amongst the scholars as to what time of the day this is referencing or this is referring to. Um, the vast overwhelming majority of the commentators on the Qur'an and Ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala lists um, a very long, very um, notable list of commentators on the Qur'an who mention that this refers to مَا بَيْنَ تُلُوعِ الْفَجْرِ إِلَىٰ تُلُوعِ الشَّمْسِ That this is from the break of dawn to the rising of the sun. This is talking about that time of the day. And amongst some of the people that he lists who have... Um, you know, given this particular interpretation are Abdullah bin Abbas, Abdullah bin Umar, uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Along with them, um, some of the very notable commentators on the Qur'an from the following generations, such as um, Abu Aliya, uh, Abu Malik, Masruq, Mujahid, Sa'id bin Jubair, Ibrahim al Nakhai, Dahak, Al Hassan al Basri, Qatada, Suddi, and many, many others. They've all said that this is referring to the morning time, the early morning time. That as the sun starts to rise, then the shade starts to extend itself. Alam tara ila rabbika kayfa madda How he has extended the shade. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after mentioning that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Walaw sha'a laja'alahu sakinan. That if he willed, if he wanted to, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had willed so, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have made the shade not change. It would have remained constant. And this is something that I'm going to more so explain towards the end. But basically what we understand, and, and this is why it's important to continue uh, to discuss and to you know, reflect upon the Qur'an throughout the different times, that basically how we now understand the time of day works is basically based off of you know, the, the, the rotation and the spinning of the earth. And we understand that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, وَلَوْ شَاءَ لَجَعْلَهُ سَاكِنًا that the shade would not have extended nor decreased, it would have just been static, it would have been fixed. What that basically alludes to, and there's a lot of different commentary from classical mufassirun. Um, so they say for instance, دَائِمًا مُسْتَقِرًا لَا تَنْسِخُهُ الشَّمْسُ That it would have just remained the same and the sun would have you know, not made any difference. And um, furthermore they comment, that yuridu ila yawm al qiyamah that this would have been till the day of judgment al ma'na law sha'a la mana' al shams al tulu'a that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to the sun would have never even risen so when you compile all of this together and some of this commentary together and based off of what we understand and what we're able to see as well what this 
what, what, we, what we can appreciate about, about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is if that was not the case, that the spinning of the earth, so that every place on the earth would be experiencing daylight hours and nighttime hours, but it would have been fixed, where some places would have constantly remained, so to speak, in the sun and in, the, in daylight, and some places would have constantly remained in nighttime, then this is something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken about in the Quran. In Surah Al-Qasas, in a couple of very, very powerful, you know, moving and gripping ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ أَرَأَيْتُمْ إِنْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمُ اللَّيْلَ سَرْمَدًا إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ That think about it. Allah says, that tells the Prophet some say, أَرَأَيْتُمْ have you thought about it? That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have made it remain night upon you for the rest of time, till the day of resurrection, till the day of judgment. Then which God what other God do you have access to that do you know about who could have then brought you daylight? So don't you listen? Don't you hear? Don't you pay attention? That if Allah, have you thought about the fact that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it daytime till the day of judgment, till the day of resurrection, what other God is there who could have brought you nighttime for you to be able to find some comfort, some peace, some relief, some reprieve? That don't you pay attention, don't you see, don't you see the reality of things? So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning that particular blessing. That even the changing of the entire course of the day and the different times of the day, that this is from a great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Allah says, ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَا الشَّمْسَ عَلَيْهِ دَلِيلًا We have made the sun its indicator. And about this, you know, um, different scholars have basically mentioned different ways to kind of interpret and understand this particular statement. Number one is that, ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَا الشَّمْسَ عَلَيْهِ دَلِيلًا That if the عَلَيْهِ go back, goes back to a ذِل That we have basically made the sun the indicator of that shade. And what that basically means is as the sun continues to rise, then the shade grows. And as the sun starts to set, then that shade decreases. That it basically is following the, 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 the trajectory or the rather path of the sun. That the course of the sun basically and how you experience the sun, that determines the shade and in what direction the shade is and how large the shade is. And basically, and all of this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at some level, you know, uh, impressing upon humanity the blessing of time. Right? Because the shade was how they used to tell what time of day it was. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding them of the fact that time is passing. You can continue to hold out and you can continue to be stubborn, but this time will not stop moving. And time will continue to move and pass. So you just have to understand and realize what you're doing with this time. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the next ayah, He says in ayah number 46, ثُمَّ قَبَضْنَاهُ إِلَيْنَا قَبَضًا yasira." Which a translator writes, but we gradually draw it towards us little by little. We gradually draw it towards us little by little. Alright? So, qabadnahu, the word qabd in the Arabic language basically means to withdraw something. It means to withdraw something. To take back something, to withdraw it. Thumma qabadnahu. Then we take that shade away. Ilayna, to us. Qabadan, in a way, yasiran. Now the word yasir, right, can be translated a number of ways. The very simple translation a lot of times people are familiar with is that the word yasir means like simple or easy. Alright? 
And some have interpreted that particular way that the word yasid here refers to something being very easy, very simple. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this is not a difficult task for us. This is not a difficult task for, task for us, but this comes very easily and very simply. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions um, other places within the Qur'an as well. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to, you know, different things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does as being very simple and very easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ذَلِكَ حَشْرٌ عَلَيْنَا يَسِيرٌ Gathering all of humanity together on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection, is very simple, very easy. It's not difficult for Allah. However, majority of the Mufassirun have not interpreted the word Yaseed here in this particular way. The reason for that is that in that other verse that I gave you a reference of, it says, Alayna Yaseed. When you use the word Yaseed with Ala, a lot of times that refers to the difficulty or the ease of a task. It is not, it is easy for us, upon us. Whereas here, that's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, that that preposition of ala is not present here. So that's why the majority of the commentators have actually mentioned, and Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma is amongst them, that they interpret the word yaseer. So the word yaseer has been translated in two ways. Aside from it being easy, number one is that the word yaseed can also mean that it's gradual. It's gradual. Step by step. Very easy to follow, very simple, very easy. Slowly just kind of like withdrawing away. Step by step. And another way that it's translated is Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. He says sari'an, very quickly. That is, the day slips away before you realize it. The day, it's, it starts to, you start to realize it's afternoon and then it's evening before you realize it. So he says that it's more so common, commenting on the fleeting nature of time. It slips away. And one of the students of Ibn Abbas, Mujahid, he actually says khafiyan. Suddi also says qabdan khafiyan. It goes very slowly and very gradually, like you almost don't even realize that it's just slipping away. Uh, Ayyub ibn Musa also comments by saying that it's qalilan qalilan, like little by little, step by step. Now, that's a very fascinating way to translate it because what that basically is now saying is that from nighttime, the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many places in the Quran, He talks about ikhtilafu layli wa nahar, the changing of night and day. But what's very fascinating is that some of the places where Allah talks about the changing of night and day, He talks about it using um, so, some very specific verbiage, some very specific language. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, yuliju layla fin nahari. Inserting the night into day and inserting the day into night. He talks about slowly extracting the day from night and the night from day. And those, that specific language, whether it's inserting or slowly peeling off the night and slowly peeling off the day. The, the very profound reflection realization that comes from that is, if you notice the transitioning from night to day, it happens very slowly and gradually. You have the break of dawn, it slowly starts to brighten up, then the sun starts to rise and it continues to lighten up everything until the sun has fully risen and then it's fully daytime. Right, and that gradual process is very remarkable because what it does is it allows us to acclimate and allows us to adjust and allows us to prepare to make the most of that daytime and that opportunity. And similarly, when evening time comes, then it slowly withdraws and it starts to dull and it starts to get a little bit, you know, uh, less, you know, there's lesser light outside. There's less light outside and slowly, slowly, the, day, the, the night starts to settle in and things become dark. Right? And again, what that does is it gives us some forewarning that the night is coming. It allows us to prepare. It allows us to wrap things up and do what needs to be done. And so think about that particular benefit of it. And a lot of times we don't fully appreciate it because again of lights and electricity and things like that. But also think about, on the, on the other hand, about the, what if it was not that particular way? Right? If you're sleeping, 
and the room is completely dark and somebody walks in and turns the light on just turns flips all the lights on what happens you throw something at them that's what happens people are like very polite they're like you wake up no 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 <laughs> you actually still don't wake up you throw something at them tell them to turn the lights off and go back to sleep but it's disorienting Right now imagine, as soon as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for it to be daytime, it's like the sun would just turn on. And then similarly, when it was nighttime, it would just immediately, just everything would go dark. There'd be at least a couple of minutes of just total absolute chaos. Right? And so this, all of these are different layers of this particular blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, after having just you know, talked about it very basically, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, you know, mentioning here, just from the surface of it. Now, what I'd like to highlight here, that many of the Mufassirun, um, such as Qurtubi and uh, Razi and many others, Ibn Ashur, and this is something that's present other places in the Quran as well, that they talk about what are some of the you know, aside from this just being a mention of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we enjoy day and night, and the way day and night, you know, changes and comes and goes, and all the different dynamics of it. But there is kind of, there, there basically is another level, another layer to this discourse. A very powerful spiritual layer to this discussion. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one, is talking about the opportunity that we have in this world. Right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the beginning of a person's life, gave him the dhilla, the increasing of the shade. And the size of the shade, actually, yes, the time of the day is important, but if you're just in an open field, then there's no shade. If you're just in an open clearing, in an open area, Oklahoma, right? So there's, there always has to be at least one comment about Oklahoma. It's, it's Texas, right? So if you're just in an open area with nothing around you, middle of nowhere, then there's no shade. The shade depends on what? Objects, different objects. Now those objects can be more natural, right? They can be trees, mountains, hills, which all are examples of what? Blessings of Allah. Are they not? Of course, they're mentioned in the Qur'an as blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beautiful landmarks that Allah has created on this earth. And then a lot of times the shade, especially in our experience, the shade depends upon like human constructed, you know, structures that have been constructed by human beings. Right? The, the, the products of human effort or human ingenuity or whatever you want to call it. Right? And that is all the result and the consequence of the raw materials that were used to make them. The intelligence that the raw materials Allah provided, the intelligence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instilled, the ability that God gave, the resources, the time, the energy, the intelligence, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave and gifted results in this. So this is kind of like it's talking about the shade extending. All right? So think about what a young person has of their own to cast a shade in this dunya. A Honda Civic, right? And then as life kind of goes on, what happens? A person builds their dunya. They have a car and a house. And then a bigger house, and a family, and a business, and so on and so forth. Right? That's kind of the shade a person has created for themselves. Because the Arabs actually used to use the word adhil. The word dhil, they used to use it to refer to like how well a person was doing. It was a sign of you know, how wealthy or how affluent a person was. All right? And so that shade continues to increase. But then what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? 
Alam tara ila rabbika kayfa maddadilla wa law sha'a la ja'alahu sakinan. If you want it, you never could have increased your shade. You were born penniless, you would have lived this life penniless, without anything in your life, no people, no love, no talent, no ability, no resources, no wealth, no property, no job, no transportation, no nothing. And you would have died penniless. Never would have gone anywhere. ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَا الشَّمْسَ عَلَيْهِ دَلِيلًا But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather says that that shade though, don't forget, is following the sun. Meaning as time is passing, it's telling you about the expiration of that shade. That as you notice that the sun has fully risen, know that your time is concluding. And as the sun starts to set, that time to enjoy that shade is almost done, it's almost gone. And then he says, ثُمَّ قَبَضْنَاهُ إِلَيْنَا قَبَضًا يَسِيرًا Then we slowly, gradually start withdrawing it. And what starts to happen in old age? The wealth, the prominence, the fame, the power, the influence, it all starts to go. Retirement. And then the health and the physical prowess starts to go. The senses and the faculties start to go. Even the mind starts to slip away. And that time runs out until finally you go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that yasiran becomes so much more profound, doesn't it? That it's going quickly, but subtly. Think about something that moves quickly, yet very subtly, so that you don't realize how quickly it's moving. You can't tell. Right? And that's how life basically passes you by. That's how life slips away. That's how that time goes away. So this is kind of another layer that you know, causes us and motivates us to spiritually reflect on the reality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning here. Another thing that some of the mufassirun have written here about what this ayah is talking about is that it's also, they, they say that it also refers to the realization of iman within your life, within this dunya. Alam tara ila rabbika kayfa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps giving you more reasons to believe. As time goes on, you actually become more intelligent, more experienced, more knowledgeable. You have more reasons to believe. The sun is calling you. You see the sun. It's one of the greatest evidences of the magnificence and the power of your Lord, Allah. But that opportunity to believe is very quickly and very subtly slipping away. Where the Prophet ﷺ, particularly talking about the sun, he said that, that, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَقْبَلُ تَوْبَةَ الْعَبْدِ مَا لَمْ تَطْلُعُ الشَّمْسُ مِنْ مَغْرِبِهَا That the tawbah of people will be accepted until the sun does not rise from the west at the end of times. And in the case of an individual, he said, مَا لَمْ يُغَرْغَرْ Until the soul does not start to depart from a person's body. That you have the opportunity to repent and turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala till that particular time. So this is something very, very powerful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us of. The, the next thing before we move on to, the last thing rather, excuse me, before we move on to the next ayah, that's very subtle. And this is something that a lot of times folks don't pick up on. But I want you to pay attention to the beginning of the ayah. Okay? And particularly for the Quran intensive students, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Alam tara ila rabbika kayfa madda? Madda. Okay? The word madda, if I tell you it's past tense, looking at that word fi'il, madda, that verb madda, what would you say is the pronoun in that fi'il? Huwa. He. He extended the shade. وَلَوْ شَاءَ What would be the pronoun in the word شَاءَ? Past tense. 
Huwa. Laja'ala hu. Ja'ala. Huwa. Thumma ja'alna. What's the pronoun embedded in the word ja'alna? Nahnu, we. So it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was speaking in the third person. Have you not looked to your Lord and Master Allah? He extended the shape. And if He wanted, He would have made it stay fixed. He would have fixed it. But then Allah says, ثُمَّ جَعَلْنَا We have made. Switches to the first person. جَعَلْنَا الشَّمْسَ عَلَيْهِ دَلِيلًا ثُمَّ قَبَضْنَاهُ قَبَضْنَا نَحْنُ We. We. Allah is speaking in the first person. This transition from third person to first person, from third person to first person, this is what's called iltifat. This is a transition. And whenever you have this type of transition where it goes from third person to first person, and sometimes it's in the reverse, we're actually going to see it go back from first person to third person. Okay? Whenever this happens, this is part of the, it, this was overall an established style of rhetoric and speech in the Arabic language. And the Qur'an of course uses it to perfection. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does this many places within the Qur'an. And the cause or the reason or the explanation behind it is that whenever this type of transition occurs, it usually occurs in order to make some type of point. To draw and to call your attention to something. And the more obvious, one of the more, one of the more obvious uh, implications of this tone when you go from third person to first person. Speaking in the third person means that it's distant. Speaking in the first person makes it more direct, close. And that's usually the more obvious implication that's present. Right? From, in going from third person to first person. So the scholars here explain that in the beginning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about if we take it literally on the surface, it was talking about the early morning time. The break of dawn. What happens usually at that time? Most people are sleep. By the time the sun comes out, everyone's... Nobody's answering because they're like, I don't, I don't want to lie in the masjid. I'm actually still asleep. <laughs> I got them blackout curtains, right? <laughs> Stuff like that, right? But by the time, it, for normal people, for productive human beings, by the time the sun comes out, everyone is awake, observing it, seeing it. They get to see the sun. And then the evening time, that's where that hustle and bustle happens. You're looking at the clock, you're looking outside, you're like, we're losing daylight. I gotta get home, I gotta finish up work. I need to get home. I need to finish this up. Before the day ends, before the bank closes, before this happens, before that happens. Right? So again, you're observing that, you're experiencing that. You don't experience the first part, so it was in the third person. You experience the latter part of it, so it's in the first person. In the spiritual sense, at that spiritual level that that discourse is happening that we were talking about, Madda Villa is talking about the beginning of life. And that's something we don't have recollection of. As babies, we have no recollection, no awareness, no cognizance of that. And even as children, there's very little, you know, cognizance and awareness, not a lot of recollection. And even as younger people, there's not a lot of attention being paid. And there's very faint, distant memories. But by the time the sun rises, we reach more of the prime of our lives. Now we're fully aware and we realize things. So again, it brings it into the first person. So things that we don't really pay attention to, or we don't realize, or we don't see, we don't interact with. But just because we didn't interact with them, or we didn't see them, or we didn't notice them, or we didn't pay attention to them, does not mean that they didn't happen. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes those blessings so many times within the Qur'an. Whether He's talking about how He created us, whether He's talking about how we came into this world, whether He's talking about being carried and nursed by our mothers. Right? That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings that up time and time again, because we don't remember, we don't recall. 
Right? So that's that transition from third person to first person. Now, in the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions, وَهُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا وَالنَّوْمَ سُبَاتًا وَجَعَلَ النَّهَارًا نُشُورًا A translator writes about this ayah, It is He who made the night a garment for you, and sleep a rest, and made the day like a resurrection. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to mention the blessings, and again, وَهُوَ الَّذِي is switched back into the third person. He is the one who made the night as a garment, a covering. Libas refers to something used to cover your body, so garment and clothing. But overall, just any type of covering can be referred to as libas. Right? We have specific definitions of libas, but those are cultural. That's just what we're familiar with, that it's got to be this or that. But when, like the Prophet would wear the izar and the rida, he would have one garment, an open just sheet, a garment that he would wrap around his waist. And then he have a separate open garment, just a sheet, a piece of cloth that he'd wrap around his upper body. That is also libas, that's also... And it's just, we would think that they're just two blankets or two sheets, but it is libas. So it's talking about the fact that he's made the night a covering for you. And the word, part of the implication of libas is satr. It covers you. Right? So the night provides that type of covering. Privacy. Right? And so that's what it's making reference to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, and this is of course mentioned many, many different places within the Quran. One of the, I don't know why. So, Something that I haven't talked about in a lot of detail, obviously because it's not really exactly the proper forum uh, for that type of discussion, but when it comes to the study of the Qur'an, when it comes to the study of the Qur'an, um, there are you know, particular principles and um, there's a methodology, that's the word I was looking for, there's a methodology to the study of the Qur'an, okay? So, and this is something that, you know, formally speaking, students of knowledge, that they study, that they're trained in, that they're disciplined in, right? To know the methodology, the proper methodology of the study of the Qur'an. Like at the seminary, we at least try um, to teach and train the students and instill within them that methodology and that discipline of how to study the Qur'an. And that discipline is a lot of times referred to as usul al-tafsir, and in a more broader sense it's referred to as ulum al-Qur'an. Alright, usul al-tafsir, the principles, the methodology, the principles of Qur'anic analysis, exegesis, alright, ulum al-Qur'an, the sciences of the Qur'an, the study of the Qur'an, okay? And I'm just using this as just some commentary that an opportunity to share a little example with you, just as folks who have been kind of sitting in and listening and observing and learning and taking notes, um, that understanding that, you know, this is not to make the Qur'an exclusive. That's never been our purpose. In fact, personal reflection on the Qur'an is something that's encouraged. Every single person, regardless of their knowledge level, regardless of where they're at and where they're coming from and who they are, should reflect on the Qur'an personally. But there's a big difference between me reading the Qur'an and reflecting on it and it impacting me, affecting me versus for me to authoritatively lecture and speak on behalf of the Qur'an saying, this is what the Qur'an is saying. There's two very different things. And of course, everybody knows how fond I am of our culture today, right? The internet culture. Um, obviously with the internet and everyone broadcasting every single time they break wind. Um, <laughs> it's, it's an obvious transition that everybody feels compelled and the need to make. Right? Well, I sat there and I reflected, I read a translation of this and I reflected on it and it really affected me. So obviously what I should do now, the only logical thing to do is turn on my phone 
as I broadcast. But uh, turn, <laughs> may Allah forgive me. But turn on my phone and then broadcast it to the rest of the world that this is what the Quran is saying. No, 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 please no. But the world needs to no, know, nobody needs to know. Nobody needs to know. See, Islam was just fine before you got here. And before you had your earth-shattering, ground-breaking revelations and reflections on the Qur'an, Islam was just fine. And Muslims survived just completely okay. And guess what? Islam and Muslims will be here after you're gone as well, inshallah. So do us all a favor and don't overestimate. You know, it's very valuable for you. All jokes aside, I kind of like to take the opportunity to um, you know, pick on the students, but... I, I speak to myself more than anyone else. That personal reflection, that personal relationship. I was telling you all the story earlier in the tafsir lessons about my grandmother. You know, till today when I read Surah Yasin, it reminds me of her. I think of her and her relationship with the Qur'an. That's, it's been transformative in my life. It's transformative in my life. It means so much to me, I can't put it into words. I can't tell you. But, that's for me, right? And that's not necessarily what the Qur'an means, right? Objectively, academically, intellectually, philosophically speaking, Surah Yasin doesn't have anything to do with my grandmother. And that's just, that's just reality. When we take it apart like that, when we look at it, it makes a lot of sense. But we seem to lack that sense a lot of times. So there's a, there's, there's a discipline and a methodology and a process to actually like academically studying the Qur'an and interpreting it. Tadabur, tafakkur, personal thoughts and reflections. Tafsir is an academic intellectual endeavor. And we have to have the humility and the discipline. That's not to say somebody here or nobody here or everybody here. No, everybody could do it or nobody could do it. Right? And there's no limitation. It's just a matter of learning how to do it. Anyone can actually do it. Right? When, even when we were studying. We had classmates, you had prodigies in the class, 16 year olds, that were geniuses, who put in the time, the work, and were gifted by Allah, and they figured it out. And we had classmates who were in their 50s and 60s. Who are putting in that work and figuring it out. In our, even now at the seminary, we'll have an 18 year old, right? We call him Hamza Bey. But uh, we'll, we'll have an 18 year old and we'll have a 60 year old, right? People whose native tongue is Arabic and people, Arabic's a fourth language they're learning, right? And so on and so forth. So there's no limitation in that regard. It's just a matter of respecting the discipline and approaching it properly and academically and intellectually. That's very important. So the reason why I brought this up, Imam Al-Qurtubi rahimahullahu ta'ala, famous commentator on the Qur'an, he actually quotes uh, Ibn Al-Arabi rahimahullahu ta'ala, who is a faqih and a mufassir of the Qur'an that Imam Qurtubi actually references quite regularly. And he says, ظن بعض الغفلة He says some ignorant people at his time, they read this ayah, He is the one who has made the night as garments and clothing for you. And they said, look, Allah is saying the night is equal to garments. Nighttime is equal to having clothes on. So what they extrapolated, what they interpreted from this was, that if when you pray salah at night, you can pray without clothes on. Because it's nighttime. Nighttime is clothing, and so you can pray in the nude. Fantastic, right? Excellent. Foolishness, right? And there's so many other examples of these types of terrible ideas that writes that this is a prime example of what happens when you don't know what you're talking about. And he actually just kind of mentions this and he says this is foolish and he says, Wala hajata ilal itnabi fi hada. And he goes, and I'm not gonna waste my time. Like, I feel like I've gotten dumber since beginning the conversation. 
right? So I'm just going to leave it right here. But I thought I would take this as I found it very fascinating for some reason. And I thought that I would just use it as an opportunity to explain there is a principle. There, there are principles. There is a methodology. There is a discipline. There is a course of study. Um, and that again, I emphasize time and time again, that is not to make the Qur'an exclusive. It's not to say only scholars should touch the Qur'an. All of you other jahil people, get away. Shush, don't touch. No, no, no. Everyone read it. Everyone reflect on it. Everyone internalize it. And everyone aspire to and put in the work to learn the discipline, the methodology. The more the merrier, the better, right? You look at the people, these great people that I mentioned, Mujahid, he was a slave himself. He was born into slavery, was freed by Abdullah bin Abbas and became a scholar of the Qur'an. So many others of them, they were foreigners, Immigrants, Arabic was not their native tongue, but they dedicated themselves to that study and became people that we can't have a tafsir lesson without mentioning their names. So, And has made sleep a rest. Has made sleep a rest. A break. Right? And the word subat comes from sabt, which means arraha, means rest. وَالْقَطْعُ To kind of put a pause on everything, to put everything on hold. Alright? And of course, this is where we get the Sabbath from as well, يَوْمُ Sabbath, The Sabbath. Where there's, you know, from the Jewish tradition. No work was done on this day. Everything was put on pause, everything was put on hold. وَالنَّوْمَ subatan. Sleep as a break, as a pause, as a hold on whatever is going on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this other places in the Quran, Surah An-Naba, وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ سُبَاتًا وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ He kind of takes you away from the world at night. You go to sleep, everything's on hold, and you basically take a break from the noise, the action, the movement of this dunya. And then Allah says, وَجَعَلَ النَّهَارَ نُشُورًا And He has made the day a resurrection, a rising. That when the daytime rolls around again, then everyone gets up, everything starts up again, and everything becomes activated, everything becomes alive, the world, the hustle, the bustle, everything starts moving again. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, this entire combination that Allah presents in this ayah, in ayah number 47, this is mentioned in a number of places in the Qur'an. In Surah Al-An'am, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ بِلَيْلِ وَيَعْلَمُ مَا جَرَحْتُمْ بِالنَّهَارِ ثُمَّ يَبْعَثَكُمْ فِيهِ Takes you away from everything at night. He knows everything that you experience during the day, and then He raises you up in the day again. Allahu يَتَوَفَّ الْأَنفُسَ حِينَ مَوْتِهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the souls away when they die. وَالَّتِي لَمْ تَمُتْ فِي مَنَامِهَا And also those who have not yet died but are actually asleep. فَيُمْسِكُ الَّتِي قَضَى عَلَيْهَا الْمَوْتِ And then if somebody is destined to die, that soul does not return back. وَيُرْسِلُ الْأُخْرَى إِلَىٰ أَجَلِ الْمُسَمَّى And everyone else, the soul is returned back to the body until the fixed time where their souls will be taken away from them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about rising back up during the daytime. And this is again a mention of all the different blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That nighttime comes, everything kind of stops. It allows us to, you know, sleep comfortably and peacefully and rest our minds and our hearts and our bodies and our souls. Right? And that rest during the nighttime and that calm during the night and really utilizing it is also an important subject in and of itself. The Prophet ﷺ in a very powerful, very beautiful hadith that we can really, really benefit from today. Particularly once again, right? Um, out of all you know, the blessing and all the fac facility um, and the opportunity that comes with technology, there's also a great trial and a tribulation and a fitna that comes along with it as well. That with technology and electricity and all these different things, right? It can really blur, you know, the line between daytime and nighttime for a lot of people. And people are sitting there on their TVs or on their computers or on their phones or on their tablets. Way into the night. Right? And it's very, very problematic. 
The Prophet ﷺ, he talks about this. The Prophet ﷺ in an authentic narration says that the fitna of the night is more severe and dangerous than the fitna of the day. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says the fitna of the day is so bad that a Muslim could become a kafir. But the fitna of the night is so severe that a mu'min could become a kafir. Another narration, the Prophet ﷺ says when nighttime comes, people get split up into three groups. There are those, the night is a blessing for them. I mean, they rest, but they also worship and do good things during the night. They spend that intimate, personal, one-on-one time with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are some people that the night is a wabal. It's a curse for them. It's doom and destruction. Where they basically set out into the night to engage in sin and immorality. And for them, the night is a terrible burden. And then the third group is the one that might not worship, but also doesn't engage in any type of evil during that night time. But rather they go right to sleep. They go to bed. Right? And so they didn't do anything bad. They didn't do anything good, but they didn't do anything bad either. And from our tradition, the Prophet says some other places has taught us that abstaining from evil in and of itself is good and is a good deed. It is a good deed. So that's actually more beneficial. So if you don't have the resolve or the himma, the energy to maybe engage in worship or something productive during the night time, then just go to sleep. It's better than the alternative. All right? And that in and of itself, and all it takes is this change of intention. Go to sleep and say, Ya Allah, I'm gonna sleep, take rest. When no masubatan, you've said the night is for rest, be safe from the evil that might be out there calling to me, tempting me. And even that sleep becomes an active form of worship and an active devotion and an active blessing. Right? So this is something that's very important. And then Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, He says, Wa ja'alin nahara. Nushura. And then he has made the daytime like a resurrection. Everything rises up once again. And so like we said, like I had commented that this in and of itself is a mention of the different blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But again, that spiritual conversation, reflection once again here is present that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, جَعَلَ لَكُمُ اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا That that time is coming where basically old age and frailty will overtake a person and cover a person. When no masubatan, and everything will pause. Kullu, kullu ib, uh, amali ibn Adama, in qata'a amalu ibn Adama illa min thalaf. Ida mata ibn Adam, in qata'a amalu illa min thalaf. Excuse me. Ida mata ibn Adam, in qata'a amaluhu. The Prophet ﷺ has said that when a human being dies, their actions end. It's done. So when that death will come, everything's on hold, everything's on pause. You are what you are, you have what you have, you've done what you've done. وَجَعَلَنْ نُحَارَ نُشُورًا But that's not the end of it. Because daytime will come again, and everyone will rise again. And it's so fascinating that Allah used the word nushur after having used it a couple of times before, in this exact surah, in the meaning of... Resurrection, And now Allah is talking about getting up during the daytime. Making that obvious connection that you experience this mini resurrection every single day. So, and when you wake up the next day, what you did the day before, yes, you slept during the night and everything was on pause. And I use the word pause because what you did the previous day, is it wiped out during the night? No, you don't get a, you don't get a fresh restart. I understand that a lot of the motivated, today is a new day. Actually, it's not. <laughs> today is the day where you get to pick up from, with the mess that you left yesterday. Today is another opportunity to clean up yesterday's mess. Right? I should write like motivational things, right? <laughs> that should be a motivational poster, right? But there's a sense of reality. We, we can sit there and tell ourselves all this mumbo jumbo and make ourselves feel great. But when we raise up on the day of judgment, we're going to be facing our deeds. Illa ma, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
This is what you invested for yourself. This is what you put forth for yourself. This is what you prepared for yourself. This is what you did. Book of Deeds. The person will say, لا يغادر صغيرة ولا كبيرة ما لي هذا الكتاب. What's wrong with this book? لا يغادر صغيرة ولا كبيرة إلا حصاء. Everything small, everything big, everything is here. ووجدوا ما عملوا حاضرة. They'll find every single thing that they did right there, staring back at them. Right. So وجعل النهار نشورا. Ayah number forty-eight. Allah subhanahu wa taala says, وهو الذي أرسل الرياح بشرا. بَيْنَ يَدَيْ رَحْمَتِهِ وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا أَنْتَهُورًا So beautiful. How, just how beautifully the surah is laid out. Because the last couple of ayat were a reality check. First it was telling you, look, you got time right now, make the most of your time. Because the sun is setting. Life will end. And the time is slipping by. Then this previous ayah basically said, look, life is life and when you die, Everything is on pause, and when you raise up again, you got to deal with what you did. And it's a little dose of reality. Like you, you, you reap what you've sown. You made your bed, now lie in it. All right, you got, you get what you got coming to you. But then this ayah, ayah number forty-eight, provides a sense of hope. Because if we're sitting here reading this now, it's not too late. So in ayah number 48, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a translator writes, It is He, Allah, it is He who sends the winds as heralds of good news before His mercy. And then it goes on to say, we send down pure water from the sky. Okay, it is He who sends the winds as good tidings before His mercy. And we send down from the sky pure water. Okay. وَهُوَ الَّذِي And He, Allah, is the one أَرْسَلَ الْرِيَاحَ He sends the winds. The winds. بُشْرًا بُشْرًا To foretell, to give good news. بَيْنَ يَدَيْ Preceding, before, ahead of رَحْمَتِهِ His mercy. Right? That that wind starts to kind of blow. The clouds start to gather. The wind starts to blow. That's telling you that rain is coming. Relief is coming. The drought is ending. Right? The earth will be nourished. Animals, you know, will, will, will be nourished. Even humanity and mankind will benefit. And in another qira'ah, it mentions, وَهُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ الرِّيَاحَ Nashran. Nashran. He sends the winds and spreads them to alert people. They spread out in Tishar and they alert people. Bainayade Rahmati. To become aware. <gasps> it's coming. The rain is coming. Let's hurry up and get out there. Let's prepare. Let's put out the buckets. Let's open up the, the irrigation. Let's get things ready. Uncover the well. And then Allah says, وَأَنزَلْنَا And we have sent down from the sky pure water. Pure water. And there's some very interesting quotes about this. Um, Thabit al-Banani, Thabit al-Banani, who was um, a great mufassir of the Qur'an, a scholar, he says, دَخَلْتُهُ مَعَا أَبِ الْعَالِيَةِ فِي يَوْمٍ مَطِيرِ he says that I was with Abu Ali. Abu Ali was a student of the Sahaba. He was also a great mufassir from the Tabi'un. He says, I was with Abu Ali, and it was a day where it was raining. Or a day where it looked like it was about to rain. And it hadn't rained for a long time in Basra, which was a major city of that time. So the streets and you know overall the, the public areas had become covered with dust and had become dry. And they had become gotten really just dusty and dry. فَقُلْتُ لَهُ فَصَلَّى And so we prayed, فَقُلْتُ لَهُ And I told him that you know, it's gotten really dusty and dirty. And he said that because it looked like the weather was changing and rain was coming. He, he read the ayah, وَأَنزَلَ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا أَنْ تَهُرَى And he said, تَهَرَهُ مَا أُسْسَمَاءِ 
Allah sends down the rain and it cleanses the earth. Right? It cleanses the earth. أَنزَلَهُ اللَّهُ مَا أَنْ طَاهِرًا Right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down this rain to cleanse the earth. فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ آثَارِ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ كَيْفَ يُحِي الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا In Surah Al-Rum, Allah says, Look to the signs of the mercy of God. How He revives the earth after it has died. وَهُوَ الَّذِي يُنَزِّلُ الْغَيْثَ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا قَرَتُهُ وَيَنْشُرُ رَحْمَتَهُ In Surah Al-Shura, Surah 42, Ayah 28, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He, Allah, Allah is the one who sends His reign after people had be, lost hope. They had begun to, they had began to despair. وَيَنْشُرُ رَحْمَتَهُ And He spreads His mercy and His blessing upon the people. And so once again, while this has a very literal meaning, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the winds start to blow and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends rain down from the sky to cleanse the earth and to provide people with that benefit and that nourishment. But at the same time, Again, that spiritual layer and level of discourse is present here again because after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instilling that reality check, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, don't lose hope though. If you're sitting here reading this, if you're listening to this, there's no reason to lose hope. Because as I mentioned previously as well, that the rain is oftentimes a parable for the Qur'an and the revelation of the Qur'an and guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the winds, they start to blow. Meaning what? Things start to change. Things start to happen. Right? Maybe things are changing in your personal life. Maybe you're no longer comfortable doing the things that you've been doing previously. Maybe you have pause about what you're doing with your life. Maybe you're not comfortable in this or in that or in that or in this anymore. And so on and so forth. And then, but don't be apprehensive, don't be afraid of that, because that is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming your way. But use that as an opportunity to really reflect and embrace. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open your heart to the Qur'an. And as Allah says, that Allah revives the dead earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will revive your heart through the Qur'an. And through Iman and through Islam. And then of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that, وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً tahura. The word tahur, there's the word tahir. Tahir means clean. The word tahur can mean one of two things or it can mean both at the same time. The word tahur means something that is very, very pure and clean. Absolutely pure and clean. Not polluted at all. And it can also mean tathir, بِمَعْنَ tathir. It can also mean something that purifies Something that cleanses. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that Allah sends that rain down from the sky and the rain is pure and it purifies. And so when the Qur'an comes down, not only is the Qur'an pure because it's guidance directly from Allah, it is the speech of Allah, the kalam of Allah, the guidance from Allah, a nur, a guiding light, a reminder from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a message from Allah, but it also is a purifying agent. It'll also purify you. It'll change your life. It'll give you purpose and direction and meaning. If you allow it to. If you let it into your heart. If you let it into your life. And no matter how far gone someone may seem. Just like that earth, those streets were so dirty and dried up. مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا قَرَنَتُ People might have been despairing, but the rain comes and revives all hope. No matter how far gone you might think you are, or somebody else might think they are, the Qur'an can bring them back. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us all to benefit from the guidance of the Qur'an. Uh, the next ayah, number 49, kind of continues on with that, but it's time for Salat al-Isha, so we'll stop and pause here, inshallah, and then we'll continue on forward. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallah bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta nusafir wa natu ilayhi.